All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Anti-Semitism 101. Let's get started. So um, first things first, what this event is and what it isn't. Um, so first off, um, we're covering a lot of ground. This event is, uh, and this presentation is, is not a checklist of what is and is not an anti-Semitism. Uh, this isn't a, uh, a list of uh, do's and don'ts. Um, this is a history. This is an analysis. Uh, this is a toolbox for us to be able to look at how anti-Semitism uh, interacts with other forms of oppression that we see today. Uh, most of this is focused very deeply on our uh, American context. We are, um, for the most part, at least everybody on this uh, who's chiming in so far is in the United States. Um, and that is where Jewish Community Action is doing our work. We, we do our work in Minnesota. Um, so when we're looking at things, we're looking at the uh, conditions in the United States. And when we can, uh, the local conditions in Minnesota. It's a little harder with some, uh, some of these big issues and some of these uh, things that are large cultural forces uh, that have been around for centuries. So um, first off, we're going to start with a, a little example. Um, so I've got two examples um, uh, here this evening. And um, when we're in person, I like to go and like call on people. It's a little harder on Zoom. So I'd like to go and just point out um, what to be looking for in this image. So here is um, uh, an image from a 2018 uh, midterm election uh, television ad uh, run here in Minnesota uh, in the first congressional district, which is Southern Minnesota for those um, who, who don't know the, the district maps. We don't all have to know those. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, so here is uh, an image of George Soros. Um, he's kind of the resident um, wealthy Jewish boogeyman who is used a lot today. We're going to see in this presentation uh, that long history of that as well. Um, and what we also see are quite a few other um, little visual dog whistles throughout this image. It's really a cornucopia, uh, so to speak. So first off, we have um, stacks of money. Uh, that one's pretty obvious, right? That one's, that one's one that people typically associate with anti-Semitism. Okay, Jews and money. Um, Okay, I get that. But what what else is going on here? Well, we see uh, George Soros with his little his villain hands uh, going on. You know, every comic book villain ever has done that little fly hands motif. But we also have words like connoisseur of chaos, funder of the left, implying uh, a tremendous amount of control and agency over um, protest movements that are going on. This is in 2018. So when we see this image of Colin Kaepernick in the back, that is, I think we're about, a, it was about a year and a half into Colin Kaepernick's protests. And the image uh, placement here is very intentional. Anybody who has ever used Photoshop or any other vi uh, visual editing suite knows that this takes a tremendous amount of time, no matter how much the little magic wand button uh, makes it easier. You have to really work to go and set this image up. This isn't just something you slap together um, and not think about. Uh, here we have Colin Kaepernick. He's looking to George Soros for instruction. After all, George Soros in this that he's the funder of the left, a connoisseur of chaos. And this plays into a very, very long history in the United States of depriving uh, Black Americans of agency in their own protest movements. Um, this is something that we'll see throughout this presentation where the civil rights movement uh, by many white nationalists and white supremacist uh, uh, thinkers uh, is not an accomplishment of Black Americans, but actually is a uh, accomplishment of the meddling Jews coming in and telling Black Americans what to do and when to do it. And this is a continuation of that motif. It is Colin Kaepernick could not have possibly decided to protest on his own. Someone else must have been footing the bill. Someone else must have been telling him what to do. And then in the bottom right, uh, yes, right hand corner, we also see an image of several people uh, clad in all black around some trash cans. Uh, they are meant to be the masked Antifas. This is pre-COVID. Wearing a mask at a protest was like considered like a terroristic sin against humanity back then. Um, and this was meant to go and invoke fear, saying that, look, the streets of your cities are going to erupt because of this connoisseur of chaos. Um, but I don't know how many of y'all actually know any anarchists. I know many. Uh, they're wonderful people. And um, I can tell you one thing. 
You could never go and get a group of 12 anarchists to go and coordinate their outfits like that. That's impossible. And that's how you know, it's not a real image. Um, so this is a good example of how we can see a lot of little things all pile into one, but none of them ever cross over into that realm of blatantly obvious, such as slurs or calls for genocide. And that that can make oppressions like anti-Semitism and make many other forms of racism difficult to identify. So next, we have an image that's very recent. This is from last week. This was in Atlanta. Um, so this image is a uh, flyer that is one of many over the last few years uh, designed by and distributed by a bunch of uh, neo-Nazi dweebs from this group called the Goyam Defense League. Um, but here uh, we see this uh, image is saying that Jews are behind uh, the existence of transgender people, uh, that this is a Jewish conspiracy. And <clears throat> throughout this image, we will see lots of little bits where it's throughout, throughout this presentation. So I'm trying to mute people as they come in. Um, throughout this presentation, we're going to see how this is a very long history of going and uh, attributing Jews as being responsible for other um, uh, minority groups, other oppressed groups, uh, gaining visibility, gaining, um, uh, gaining civil rights. Uh, within the United States. So here we see that um, Jews are being blamed for um, uh, the existence of trans people. Um, and this, of course, is not new. Uh, th this is a uh, very particular feature of modern anti-Semitism. And when I say modern, I mean the last several hundred years, not just the last couple of decades. There's a particular kind of anti-Semitism that portrays movements for other oppressed people's liberation, here the trans community, as a Jewish plot exaggerating Jewish power in an anti-Semitic way while simultaneously denying trans people's power and agency in an equally bigoted way. So similar to the way in which in that previous image from five years ago, we saw a um, implication that Colin Kaepernick could not have uh, engaged in protest, uh, if not for the meddling Jew, in that case, uh, George Soros. Here again, we see that trans people, trans communities could not possibly exist if it were not for these meddling Jews. So why did we get here? How did we get here? Well, there's a lot of background. And for the next few moments, you're gonna be wondering, what the heck does this have to do with anti-Semitism? It has a lot. It has a lot to do with all of the forms of oppression that we see here today. So there's massive social changes that have happened globally over the last 500 years. And we often forget about them or we forget about pockets of them. So the first thing I want us to know about and think about are the enclosures. The enclosures are the removal of people from their common lands. Um, mass privatization puts these assets into control of a much smaller segment of the population. Example, nobles or industrialists. And removed peoples now have to sell their labor to obtain base necessities they used to have. Now in Europe, this happened in the post-plague period. So in the 14 and 15 and 1600s, peasants were being pushed off of their lands by a rising nobility and a, um, a mercantile aristocracy um, who is pulling people off of their lands. People no longer can go in a uh, subsistence farm and they begin to move into cities. Cities become overpopulated. And at the same time, people who have gobbled up all this land are simultaneously becoming very, very wealthy. And they wanna turn their money into more money. And this is when we start to see colonization come into effect in the late 1400s early 1500s and throughout all the way into the 1800s. Colonization takes effect as Europeans go and look to the rest of the world for places that they want to go and extract more wealth from. The enclosures happen over and over and over again. They happen to indigenous peoples in the Americas. They happen to uh, indigenous peoples in Africa, in Asia, as people are removed from their lands over and over again. And colonization is not just enclosures on a new land, it's also replacement and displacement of indigenous native communities with populations from, quote, home countries. In this case, we're referring mainly to European countries at this time. So colonization is also marked heavily by enslavement and genocides. Resources are taken from those colonies to enrich the imperial core, and the people back in those colonies have very little to show for it. Even in our American context, when we think about the American Revolution, 
even in our mythologized version of the American Revolution, we still identify that within colonization, Americans had to go and make all of this, uh, uh, create all these cash crops, send them over to Britain. Britain would send manufactured goods back at a huge markup. And Americans were like, we don't like that. Well, the simple fact is that happened to everyone. And it continues to happen to many peoples today. And colonization didn't simply just stop. And it also was not just one time period. So colonization, when it hits its peak, when you build a lot of infrastructure off of a, uh, a colonial uh, machine, you then get imperialism. Because imperialism isn't simply just owning countries on a map like we might think of from school, where we look at an old map and Britain owns most of Africa. Uh, that is imperialism. But imperialism is not just owning a place on a map. It's an economic relationship in which people in a government of a country are trapped in restrictive and extractive debt relationships with imperial core countries. Note, I want to stress that this doesn't require physical occupation of a territory by an imperial power. Just because Britain and France no longer formally own uh, many places in, uh, in Africa does not mean that they are still not imperial powers. To, to this very day in Western Africa, um, most of the former French colonies still have to bank in the colonial franc, which is a fictional currency. Oh. It's not used for everyday transactions. And all of these countries have to collect all of their taxes and then bank it in the form of this uh, currency in French banks. And then French banks get to take a certain percentage off of the top as a debt that these countries owe France for their own independence. That's a perfect example of how imperialism continues to this day. So I want us to be thinking about all of these because all of these impacted cultures and societies. History is not just dates and old dead dudes. This is something that even Bill and Ted realized on their excellent adventure 30 plus years ago. Um, it's really important for us to think about this because each one of these big, huge shifts changed the world as we know it. It is why we can get all of these manufactured goods from around the world. It's why we can be here on Zoom together. We're all using machines that are built out of modern day imperialist relationships as people are working in cobalt mines that are owned by imperial uh, uh, core mining companies, Canadian companies, American companies, but none of the profits, none of that money gets to stay in those countries that are being just pulled to pieces for uh, these minerals. These things still go on today. And that's really important because it, it impacts not just how people move through the world, but it impacts the stories we tell. It impacts the way in which we think about things. It impacts our language. It impacts our social systems, our political systems. All of these uh, exist. We can't just look at history in a vacuum. We can't look at it as a simple little slice of maybe 10 years of the civil rights movement. All of these things are built on each other. So. Um, that brings us to the next big core thing we should think about, which is Christian hegemony. And Christian hegemony is the predominance of Christian values, belief systems, and cultural norms throughout all aspects of a society, including educational, political, social, economic, and legal systems. So Christian hegemony doesn't mean that every Christian out there in the world is saying, ha, 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 I'm going to go and control the world. That would be Christian supremacy. That's where you say, I really want to do this on purpose. Christian hegemony is a good example of what happens when all of those systems have been around for so long. All of those imperial countries, all of those European nations were ruled by Christian kings and queens and nobles for up until the last 60, 70 years, most of those places still had a very formal relationship between the church and state. They were not secular countries. They brought in a lot of Christian theology into their legal systems, into their social systems, into everything in there. And that's what Christian hegemony can look like. It can be leftover laws that say you can't sell alcohol on Sundays, but it can also be what happens when you have a school board that's only Christians and they don't realize that, oh, wow, there's people of other faith groups in our school district who need other holidays off. When you prioritize only one religion's holidays, uh, that would be an example of hegemony. So we see a lot of Christian hegemony in this country because there's a lot of people who identify as Christian or who come from culturally Christian backgrounds. So that's what we mean by Christian hegemony. It's something that's in and around us in the United States because there's a lot of people who have um, Christian backgrounds. Um, so that's what Christian hegemony means. It can have really, really adverse social effects, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every single person who is Christian is purposely doing these things.
So how is all of this relevant to today's presentation? Well, the forms of oppression that we see today, they're culturally ingrained and they've been formed and reinforced by these economic relationships and social relationships over the last several centuries. Anti-Semitism and racialization are direct results of these economic and social shifts, and we will be seeing how and why throughout this presentation. And in the 21st century, we are interconnected as a global society. We need to understand that these large cultural notions like racialization cannot be viewed in isolation in time and space. We can't just go and view a couple of years in the 1950s to understand race relations in the United States. We can't just go and view the 1940s and understand anti-Semitism. We can't do that. We're going to miss really important parts of the story or we'll miss how things have changed or what still stays the same. So these huge changes in human society have also created a near universal feeling of detachment within at least imperial core countries that we're, we're going to be calling social malaise for the, the length of this presentation. Um, which is an important aspect when we're thinking about the spread of racism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and other forms of hate. So what is social malaise? That's a big old buzzword. Um, so social malaise, this is a term that um, I got from a 1948 examination of anti-Semitism published by the American Jewish Committee um, that looked at how American anti-Semitic, anti racist, and fascist agitators in the 1930s and 40s in the US, because there were a lot of them, uh, we think that we didn't have a huge fascist movement here, but we, we had quite a large one back then. And they looked at the, the rhetoric that was used by uh, these uh, groups, but they also went and looked at why did people respond uh, so willingly, so excitedly for these things. And what we need to be thinking about is all of these huge changes have massive social and emotional effects on human beings. Individually, socially, we're not we're not doing okay. I, it's no longer controversial to really say things aren't particularly great right now. People are quite clearly lonely. People are quite clearly distressed about the economic situation, about the increasing violence that we're seeing uh, in the United States. Um, that all looks like social malaise. Social malaise can also be those aspects where people feel like the social promises that were made to them aren't being met. It can look like so many things. Um, what, what it, we need to be viewing it as is we're not having all of our needs met. And when not all of our needs are met, people are going to feel off. People are going to recognize that something is not right. And they're going to be looking for answers for why things aren't right. What we need to understand is that while there's many great ways that we can address social malaise, there's many things that we can do to, to fix those things that don't involve violence. There's many things we can do. We can go and build mutual aid societies. We can go and uh, push for policies that will make people's lives better, socialized housing, or any number of things. But what fascists realize, what, what anti-Semitic agitators, what, what really active racist groups realize is that you can agitate this feeling, this very common feeling to animate violence against their uh, social and political enemies. They look at this, they look at it as a paint can that you can pry open and spill all over the place, that just a little bit of a push will push people into immense violence, which will then get them the uh, desired effect. And that's why we need to be thinking about social malaise, because it's something that is so common that we should not be shocked that people are able to agitate it into something horrific. What we need to do is find ways in which we can reduce that malaise or get rid of it altogether. So now this gets us to the anti-Semitism portion. I know, you're probably all quite relieved. We're now onto this anti-Semitism part. That's what I signed up for. I didn't sign up for a world history class, but we live in a world, so you have to. So I'm sorry, um, I'm just gonna do that. Um, but here's what we gotta know about anti-Semitism. Just like any other form of oppression, it's more than just slurs or personal hatred. It's not just something that people carry as, a, uh, as like a pathology inside of themselves of some sort of complete moral wrongdoing. It is absolutely uh, reprehensible when people uh, hold oppressive notions, but it's not just an individual failing. It comes from social effects. It comes from this larger world around us. You're not simply born a racist. You're not simply born anti-Semitic. You're inculcated it. Uh, you're inculcated into it over time. You have to be exposed to this thinking to think it. So anti-Semitism, what is it? Well, it's a system of ideas 
based on white supremacy and European Christian hegemony, passed down through a society's institutions to enable the scapegoating of Jews and the ideological or physical targeting of Jews that results from that. I know, it's a really long mealy mouth definition. It's honestly quite difficult to go and put any form of oppression uh, that is um, uh, built into a society into a simple definition. It's quite hard to do this. It's much easier to just write a full book or do a 90 minute long presentation. But what is, it, what is Semitism? Why am I hearing Semitism tacked in there? So the term anti-Semitism was coined in 1879 by this racist dweeb over here named Wilhelm Marr, who was a German nationalist, which is not particularly ever a good sign. And he wanted to give his, his worldview, previously called Judenhass, which meant Jew hate, a little more credibility. So he proposed this idea of Semitism, borrowing the word from the budding world of linguistics, imagining a worldwide Jewish Semitic conspiracy where Jews were inherently biologically inclined to undo European, Christian, or later uh, commentators would call it Aryan society. And his response uh, was, well, if Jews are inherently inclined to undo a society, it is the logical thing as a European to be against Semitism, to be anti-Semitism. So this is where the term comes from. But why, why does it come up in the, this period of the 1870s? A thing that we need to be considering is that this is the height of imperialism. This is the height of all of those massive world shifts that we were talking about. And at the same time, there is a scientific and industrial revolution going on. Just about a decade earlier, Charles Darwin uh, publishes On the Origin of Species, which introduces the world to the concept of um, evolution. And while many commentators at the time really didn't like that idea applying to humans uh, in terms of evolutionary biology, they loved applying uh, the idea to humans in terms of social Darwinism, where they said, okay, okay, we don't necessarily like this idea of people like evolving over thousands, uh, millions upon millions of years, but we do really like this idea of a competition between the races, because already you had centuries worth of infrastructure built in to racist systems. You had centuries worth of European enslavement of peoples from the Americas and from Africa and in Asia. You had centuries worth of viewing people as less than, and now it could be viewed as scientific. This is the same time people are measuring skull sizes as phrenologists trying to find the perfect dimple size that showed the perfect level of intelligence and beauty. So this is where Wilhelm Marr is coming in with his concept of anti-Semitism. He's coming in in a time of rebranding long-standing concepts that uh, existed through uh, social and legal mechanisms and creating scientific justification to say, not only are these existing now, but they are biological imperatives. They are natural occurrences. And that is what anti-Semitism comes out of as a term. Um, and also during this time period, we see a big change in the way in which um, uh, anti-Jewish oppression looks. So when I say that, I mean, there's some big changes because anti-Semitism has changed a lot over time. So first off, let's, let's rewind all the way back to the High Roman Empire. So this is in the century or so after um, uh, like Christ's crucifixion, um, and the expulsion of uh, Jews from much of uh, the Roman province of Palestine. Um, we have early Christianity. Uh, the books have not been codified yet. They don't really even know what's in the Bible yet. That doesn't happen until like the third century at the Council of Nicaea. But we start seeing the concept of supersessionism starting to appear. This is the idea that Jews, now in the era without a temple, um, are, are outdated. You got to get with the times. Look, we already had a Messiah. You got to go and upgrade from the 1.0 version of the religion to the 2.0 version. It's basically the annoying update on your computer saying you need to, uh, the little notification on your computer telling you you have to update. Um, that's what it looks like in those first few centuries. But then as Christianity becomes ascendant within a declining Roman empire, as it becomes the official religion, supersessionism is coupled with state power and becomes discrimination um, because oh. the Roman Empire was no stranger to the discrimination of Jews and to the um, isolation of Jews. And now you have this uh, religious aspect to it. 
Um, so that builds over time. Post-Roman Empire, early Middle Ages, um, we begin to see the changing of the story from Jews are outdated to Jews are sinister. This is where we begin to see things like the blood libel, which is the accusation that Jews go and kidnap uh, children to go and um, you know use their uh, use their blood for uh, ritualistic purposes. This is the same time that we're starting to see Jews being blamed for outbreaks of the plague. There was not just one major plague outbreak. They happened all of the time during this period. The biggest ones were in the 600s and again in the 1300s. Uh, but plague is something you see uh, not often often, but at least every 50 to 100 years, um, depending on where you are in Europe at the time. But you begin to see Jews blamed for plague, uh, blood libel. You also start to see appearances of um, uh, Jews as demonic, uh, you know, attributions of horns, tails, things like that. Um, because at this point in time, most people have not encountered uh, Jews. You don't see too many Jews. There aren't that many of us. There still aren't that many of us. And at this point in time, if you were in Europe and you were a Christian, you really only heard about Jews as, as an ancient people in the old books or as these strange people who use a different language, who live in a different part of town, who can't be trusted. And why do you believe that? Because the church is telling you that. Because at this point in time, this is also when the church adopts um, the um, uh, official uh, uh, theology that um, Jews are responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. Makes sense. When the church takes over the Roman Empire, do you want to blame the Romans for the crucifixion or the Jews? You're the Romans now. You wouldn't want to blame yourselves. So this is where we start to see the concept of Jews as sinister begin to appear over these several centuries. Um, but a couple of things begin to change. Uh, in the late Middle Ages, uh, with, the, uh, with the immense plague that happens, um, we start to see shifts in the way in which society is run. Not only do we see the enclosures, the removal of the remaining peasantry from their lands, um, but we also see the increasing importance of finance. And we start to see concepts that we now know as early modern banking begin to appear. And this is where I'll be getting to this in a, a moment in more detail, but this is where we begin to get the, uh, the concepts of Jews being bankers and money lenders beginning to uh, become hyper popularized within the European imagination. But another major event happens within the 1400s, and that is the Spanish Reconquista, which is the expulsion of Jews and Moors who were Muslims who lived on the Iberian Peninsula for many centuries. This was the expulsion of all of these communities from Spain and from Portugal. And at this point in time, this is when we also see the first laws introduced that would later on be used as um, the uh, structural inspiration for the one drop rules that we see in places like the United States during the eras of segregation. This is where the legal introduction of the idea that if you have just a single drop of Jewish or Moorish blood in your background, you can never truly be a Spaniard or um, uh, someone from Portugal. Um, so this is when you begin to see these things. And all of these begin to evolve over time. Those one drop rules evolve within the Spanish and Portuguese, and then later the English colonies into the segregationist laws that we're most familiar with in our American context. And over these centuries, we begin to see the enclosures intensify, colonization goes into bigger effect, um, a, the slave trade begins, um, colonialism continues to intensify, and at the end of this period, as imperialism rises, we also see the concept of nationalism become quite popular. And this is where we begin to see the concept of dual loyalty, where Jews cannot truly be loyal to the countries they live in. This is because at this point in time, uh, the oppression of Jews in Europe largely comes from a theological standpoint, from a Christian standpoint. But as nationalism comes around, as the French Revolution comes around and the Enlightenment and all of these things, there is a very secular version of European um, uh, uh, government that still is very inspired by its Christian origins. But now it says, no, 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 we are indeed secular. We just don't have a Pope guy uh, in charge. Because I say Pope guy because some of them have different uh, religious figures, but they're all basically serving as a Pope. Um, but because they've separated and divorced themselves from an official religious uh, aspect of their governments, they say we are secular. However, Jews, 
cannot be both German and Jews. They cannot be both French and mm. Jewish. They can only be one or the other because Jews are all across Europe. We are in diaspora and you can't trust them. Look, they know someone across the border, someone from that rival country. We could not possibly trust them. And that is how dual loyalty becomes hyper popularized. Those notions already did exist over that long period of time, but nationalism really makes dual loyalty something that is a part of the um, 19th century European uh, anti-Semitic uh, imagination. And as we see uh, uh, imperialism hit its highest points uh, with World War I, um, as the imperialist powers exhaust themselves in four years worth of war, um, a lot of social malaise kicks in, a lot of people are quite disillusioned, and fascism comes to Europe. And this is where we begin to go and see massive genocide against Jews. Um, but one, some of the uh, biggest changes that we begin to see is this um, concept of Jews as in control of maybe the banks of your country, in control of perhaps your uh, nation's leader, to a global conspiracy, which we will be getting into more uh, in the following slides. But all of this is to say is this is both an ancient and extremely uh, extremely modern um, uh, form of oppression. Jews have been put in a buffer and scapegoat role physically and rhetorically for a long time. So what do I mean by a buffer or scapegoat role? I think we all know what a scapegoat is. It's being blamed for something that you didn't do. You know, someone who did something wants to blame someone else for it. But in the early modern period, the 1400s through the 1600s, I know it doesn't sound like it's that modern to us, um, but that is what it is called. Um, in Italian city-states, we begin to see uh, the advent of early modern banking. And many of us, through word of mouth, through kind of pop history, think of, oh, well, Jews are associated with banking and money because Christians in Europe weren't allowed to go and loan money with interest because that was a violation of rules against usury, um, which is the charging of exorbitant interest rates. Well, that's partially true. Um, that was true. If you were really involved in the church and you did that, yeah, you'd probably get expulsion. But some Italian princes and nobles realized there's some loopholes to get around it. They began to open up their own banks, but they brought in many Jews from around the Italian peninsula and from uh, places like Spain as they were being expulsed from Spain. They said, come here, you'll be safe. And they walled off the Jews on an island in Venice that they could not leave except for certain periods of the day uh, to go and work at banks. And Jews would work in the banks and they would be the teller. They'd be the person, the loan officer um, or whatever its equivalent was called back then. But the important part is, is that the loophole in here is that the Italian princes, all Catholics, get to go and take all of those profits. They own the banks, but who is the person charging you that interest? Who is the person sitting across that desk from you charging you through the nose? Well, it's that Jew. And that is where that story begins. And it does grow because Jews are also heavily segregated from the rest of European society. That being walled off and on an island is not unique to Venice. It is where we get the term a ghetto, but it is not unique there. Jews are segregated into little neighborhoods all across Europe. And they had been for many, many centuries at this point. And Jews not being allowed into other parts of society means that nobody else is meeting them, meaning no one else knows what they're like. So they're only hearing the stories they hear from people in power. It also means that Jews aren't allowed to work in most industries. So the very few industries that Jews are allowed to work in, you're going to build family traditions of working in those because there's no other jobs available. It's that or working in an informal economy spaces, making handmade goods and trying to hawk them on the streets. So another thing that we can see during this period in Eastern Europe is the concept of Jews as landlords. So in, this is not exclusive to Eastern Europe, but this is where concepts like that um, have some of their origins. So in Eastern Europe, as the nobles began to gobble up all of those lands off of the peasantry, Jews were similar to in the Italian city-states used as middlemen. They were used as tax collectors. They were used as rent collectors. Um, going from village to village, collecting the money for the princes. And people in Eastern Europe, as they're starving from various blighted harvests, are wondering, why isn't my prince doing anything for me? Well, the person who comes to my door every year and collects what little food I have, or because you didn't pay your taxes um, you know, 
di direct deposit like you do today. You had to go and pay it in lump sums uh, that were kind of randomly assigned back then, either in food and goods or in, in largely like lump silver or gold. And if you were a poor person who, who had all of, uh, who had very little, and someone comes to your door and takes that from you, and then you're seeing nothing from it, you're probably going to blame that person for it. And that's the reason why Jews were continued to be used in these spaces, um, because it's a very, very convenient use. You can go and get use out of that community that you've segregated out of the rest of society. And that lower level of your society also views Jews as the source of their oppression, even though Jews are even more oppressed than they are at this point in time in Europe. But over the course of the um, uh, 17 and 1800s, so that period of enlightenment, Jews begin to go and see what is called, um, it's often referred to as the liberation of the Jews in Europe. And this is, this is when Jews are finally allowed to go and work in more industries, where Jews are allowed to attend university, they're allowed to become officers in the militaries, they're allowed to go and be all of the things that anybody else can be. Kind of that, that old American dream type of thing, only we're over in Europe. Um, and because of this, people are starting to see Jews in various social spaces for the first time. Um, and there are some Jews who do very well, um, but not all Jews are doing well. In fact, the vast majority are not doing too well. Us as Americans, um, uh, if you are descended from Jews who moved over here in the 1850s, we weren't doing well in the 1850s. We weren't doing well in the 1880s. That's why our great, great grandparents were moving over here. There were pogroms, we were incredibly poor, but occasional people were allowed to succeed. And this helped go and build um, out the uh, notion that gives us the elder, uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion, which is the template for most modern day conspiracy theories. The protocols of the elders of Zion was the meeting was supposed to be the meeting minutes of a secretive group of rabbis plotting world domination. This was published in 1903 by the Tsar of Russia, um, was a secret police. And the Tsar of Russia at the time, in addition to being morally bankrupt, was literally bankrupt. And Russia was beginning to collapse at the seams. It held on for another, the Tsars held on for another 14 years, but this helped him stick around for a few more years. The idea was to encourage another pogrom, another large scale uh, act of violence against Jewish villages um, to go and distract the population from the ongoing uh, collapse of parts of the Russian empire and state. And the Elder Protocols of Zion was a very, very effective piece of propaganda in Russia in 1903. And then it became hyper popularized in our modern, in our uh, contemporary era due to people like Henry Ford who published it in English, and then it was republished by the Nazi party of Germany after they read Henry Ford's versions of it. The Elder Protocols of Zion, if you go and you look at something like QAnon, if you go and you look at something like there are lizard people controlling the world, if you peel back just about one layer off of any of these, it is just the Elder Protocols of Zion, just with a couple of names and seats rearranged. But another important thing to be thinking about in our American context are Red Scares 1 and 2, which we're going to be getting to in much more detail when we approach the uh, white nationalism portion of this presentation. But what we need to know is that the Red Scare wasn't just uh, Joe McCarthy in the 1940s uh, with his, uh, I have a list of all of these communists in Hollywood. It started in 1919 uh, with the Red Scare of 1919, which was largely targeting Black and Eastern European Jewish communities in the United States. These were viewed as hotbeds of Bolshevism. The entirety of the American uh, um, uh, industrial aristocracy, so to speak, was paranoid that the Bolshevik revolution was going to come to their shores. And the groups that they looked at as the greatest threats were Eastern European Yiddish speaking Jews, because many of them were involved in labor, uh, labor union advocacy uh, through the Jewish labor bund, uh, which was huge over in uh, Eastern Europe. And then also black Americans were present in more places than just the South at the time. This is during the uh, first waves of the first great uh, migration where many black Americans were moving out of the South, hoping to go and find better lives uh, outside of the Jim Crow South and found that that wasn't necessarily the promise in many of these places. Um, and the fact that many Jews who were recently emigrated from the shuttle, from segregated places were going and organizing across the color line um, uh, on factory floors was an immense threat 
to uh, these labor industrialists. So a long, long history of anti-Black racism in the United States cross-pollinated with a long, long history of European anti-Semitism in a very big way here in the United States in 1919, and it has continued ever since. So lastly, there's lots and lots of stereotypes and common tropes about Jews. Um, and like I said, this presentation is not uh, one of those presentations where we're going through a checklist of stereotypes and tropes, but some of the big ones are all, you always wanna be thinking about what time period, what history does this come from? Because that can inform us how and why people start thinking about these things, even, even in this day. So some examples of common tropes would be things like, Jews are good with money. Sometimes these sound like compliments. Oh, I'm not very good with money, but you're so good with money. I wish I were. That still is messed up. You're implying that Jews have some sort of special characteristics, special traits, some sort of biological even um, uh, component to them that makes us uh, so good at perhaps uh, money or being lawyers or any number of things. Sometimes these sound like compliments. And this is where um, anti-Jewish um, uh, thought can look a lot like uh, forms of the model minority myth that we see here in the United States. The model minority myth is a very racist notion that sometimes a lot of people think uh, is not being racist. Oh, well, I'm not being racist. I'm saying your community is very good at something. A, mo a good example of the model minority myth in the United States is how Asian American communities are looked at by many uh, communities as well. Asian Americans are innately better at school or any number of these types of things where statistics are used to go and say, here is a ranking of different racial and ethnic groups. This group's inherently better than that group, which is still a racist notion. It still is the idea that you can go and create an order of operations to human beings based off of their uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. And that is a very racist notion. And the model minority myth very similarly uh, can appear with uh, anti-Jewish tropes as well. Um, in fact, much of the integration of Jews into Europe uh, during that period of liberation in the, in the 19th century, we can see as analogous, but not exactly the same as uh, the uh, white backlash to affirmative action programs um, or the mere presence of people of color in workplaces to this very day. The thought that this person did not earn that spot, they simply were given it by a nature of who they are. Similar types of notions were applied to Jews throughout Europe during that period of liberation in Europe where you did not earn this, you connived your way to the top here using an anti-Semitic uh, tinge term. These are good examples of where you can go and see these concepts of uh, model minority myths or racial hierarchies appear in our versions of stereotypes. So what does anti-Semitism look like? Well. Out there in the wild, it functions differently than other types of oppression that we're most familiar with in the United States, which makes it a little harder to recognize because on the surface, it creates this illusion that it's punching up. Other forms of oppression that we're most familiar with in the United States are quite clearly punching down. A lot of times it's very clearly targeting and attacking communities that if you've been paying attention at all, have never had a real shot at any form of equality in this country until at least very recently. And even that you have centuries worth of being put an entire half lap behind everyone else. So other forms of oppression can very quickly be easier to recognize because they quickly look like bullying. They quickly look like they're punching down and picking on people, which makes it, which can make it easier to teach people about them. But with anti-Semitism, it has this illusion that I'm not being anti-Semitic. I'm just, I'm just punching up against the man, right? I'm not just saying, I'm not saying anything bad about Jews, just these couple of Jews, this cabal of Jews, that still is anti-Semitic. And it has this illusion of power. So what do we mean by that? Well, one of the main pillars of anti-Semitism is to keep this Jewish face on the front of power so that Jews become the targets of people's rage. In those older time periods, it was, Jews are the banker across the table from you, charging you interest. Jews are the tax collector going and taking your money. In a later time period, it was, look, there is a very successful Jewish banker. That means all banks are controlled by the Jews. That would be in the 1800s, the Rothschild conspiracy. Um, and today you can see it with people like George Soros, 
the idea, oh, George Soros is raining money into communities to go and control them, or the, uh, the accusation that Jews are in control of all of Hollywood, because there are many Jews within entertainment spaces, that, rem that none of that involves investigation for why, how did Jews end up in, invest uh, in ent entertainment spaces? No, merely their presence, their visibility is the proof in the pudding of this uh, notion of power. Because most of us, especially when it comes to things like entertainment, have absolutely zero control over entertainment. We have no control over what's shown on the television to us. We have no control over the scripts that are picked up and greenlit by all of these uh, things. We have no control over the fact that most television shows take place in two major cities, LA and New York. Um, that's largely because that's where the studios are based. But it makes people begin to feel that, that feeling that there's something wrong, there's something not quite right, and they begin to go and ascribe it to other things. Oh, well, it must be those Jewish writers. It must be this. It must be that. So that's why we need to be understanding that, um, that an essential, integral part of anti-Semitism as we know it today involves this aspect of Jewish power. If we went into a time machine a thousand years ago and talked to a peasant in rural Poland or anywhere in rural Europe and told them that Jews were in control of the world, that would make no sense to them. The context for where Jews were, the rights that Jews had, it wouldn't make sense. Jews were incredibly poor. The things about Jews being demonic, being sinister, those parts would make sense to a peasant a thousand years ago. But this aspect of global control, of, of total control, would make no sense because the story of anti-Semitism has changed with the story of society. So like a turning gear, it's mechanical. The last few, the last century and a half of what we see is modern anti-Semitism, this, this, this uh, form of anti-Semitism that describes immense power uh, to Jews. It's largely cyclical. And it's, we generally see it get strongest when Jews are otherwise assimilated and doing well. And that's a feature, not a bug. In France, it was seen with the uh, Dreyfus affair where the accusation that a Jewish officer had given all these state secrets to Germany because he was Jewish and he spoke Yiddish, which is a Germanic language. And he had family on the other side of the artificial border. He was an officer. Jews just a generation before weren't allowed to be that. They were assimilated, they were doing well. In the period of Weimar Germany, Jews were doing very well. They were involved in many spaces as academics in so many places. There was, there was an immense amount of art and thought coming out of Jews working in social spaces with other communities. And it was viewed as, this is a Jewish plot. This was a Jewish plot to undo our society. In fact, the first um, uh, uh, books burned in Nazi Germany were from the Institute of Sexual Studies which is actually named in that neo-Nazi flyer that I showed earlier. And that was uh, opened up by a gay Jewish man who built an entire institution looking to go and show that queer identities are real identities. And so much research was lost in those opening salvos of Nazi rule. And a big part was because for a very, for a long time, a key part of the Nazi machine, the propaganda machine before they obtained power was Jews are responsible for these various forms of what they were calling social degeneracy. And the existence of queer communities, the existence of trans communities was viewed as an example of this. And the existence of Jewish professors was an example of this. And that is why we say it's like a turning gear. It's cyclical and generally strongest when Jews are otherwise assimilated and doing well. Because that is when you can say, look, the conspiracy is in full force. So we have to have some power and influence to make any of these stories seem true. It wouldn't make sense to go and say Jews are in control of Hollywood if you didn't have any Jews in Hollywood to point to. There has to be somebody that you can use as that face, as that scapegoat for the larger community. And some anti-Semitic tropes seem like compliments, but they're still lies that white supremacy tells us and they should be interrogated. And I already talked about those already those examples of the model minority myths. But all of this is to say that anti-Semitism is a synthesis of historical and structural scapegoating. It's more than a series of individual acts of hatred. It's a set of lies that white supremacy has told us, and it's for a reason. Jews have never been considered fully white um, in, within this European uh, mindset. Jews were always on the outside, on the margins of European society. 
And even as they have uh, seen more integration into European society, as Jews begin to see more integration, there all there has at least over the last two and a half, uh, two centuries or so, there's been that turning gear where the rubber band snaps back. And anti-Semitism has changed drastically from its origins in Christian persecution. It doesn't look the same as it did when it was purely just about supersessionism. And as the world has become simultaneously more interconnected and unequal, the power of anti-Semitic narratives have grown. Right now, the United States has a greater level of wealth inequality than pre-revolutionary France did. So that point that made the French peasantry align with like French businessmen to overthrow the, the uh, priesthood and the king because of how unequal it was, we are at a more unequal stage in terms of the wealth gap here in the United States in 2023 than France was in 1789. It is no surprise that anti-Semitic narratives have grown in popularity because people can feel that unequalness. They can feel that there is something not right. And anti-Semitism provides a story for why. It, it creates an illusion for why. It's not the story for why, but if people don't have any explanations made available to them, it's really easy to grasp onto the nearest available one. And lastly, capitalism, the global system that we live in today, doesn't matter what a country calls itself, all of them are engaging in capitalism. They're all doing it. Um, it needs racism in order to dehumanize black and brown people, to exploit for free and cheap labor. All of those the periods that I took you through earlier, the act of enclosures, the act of colonization, imperialism, all of that is building up the system of capitalism. It is the transition from a feudal uh, arrangement to a capitalistic arrangement. One of there is private property held in a uh, bloodline nobility to now there is private property held in a less bloodline nobility because people do have the occasional ability to go and hit the lottery and make it. Maybe they might be able to go and get past many of the institutional barriers and make a fortune for themselves, but the vast majority don't. That exploitation is still happening. Capitalism, in order to build the big infrastructure of Europe, needed the raw materials from Africa, from Asia, from the Americas. You couldn't do it without the coal taken away from there, without the guano. Weirdly enough, guano was huge for fertilizer back in the day. All of these things had to be removed from the rest of the world and brought to Europe or brought to uh, American cities to build them into what they were. And black and brown people are still being exploited for free and cheap labor to this day. I used those examples earlier of uh, the, the mines and uh, uh, the cobalt mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Those are just one of many examples. Sweatshops, great examples. All of these, capitalism always needs to go and cut corners. It always needs to go and have a uh, cheapest possible uh, production to go and maximize those profits. Um, that it's not just about free exchange. It is a very specific system. Uh, it's not just, I give you a uh, pair of nail clippers, you give me dollars. That's not how it works. Um, that is just trade. That's not capitalism. Capitalism is a very specific system and it's the one we live in today. And anti-Semitism has been an essential part of that story of the growth of capitalism. Because when we look at most anti-Semitic notions today, most of them are starting to describe core elements of capitalist power accumulation. It's the accumulation of an immense amount of wealth among a very few people. It is the accumulation of the immense amount of wealth behind closed doors in the hands of large banking agencies, in the hands of industries, um, and away from everyday people. That is what capitalism looks like as it builds and builds and builds. But anti-Semitism looks at that and says, no, 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 it's just the Jews. So what does anti-Semitism do? It keeps the wheels of economic and social oppression hidden from view. It's meant to obscure class, caste, and racial oppression. It always has since it began being instituted by church and state in order to go and animate violence against a very small powerless community to go and distract away from the um, decadence of the medieval church to the, I suppose, I guess it still is decadence, the decadence of uh, uh, European kings and queens uh, throughout the 17 and 1800s, 
to even the decadence of, of the billionaire class today, it says, no, 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 no. It's just the couple of Jewish ones who are the problem. Um, so how does it do it? It says that Jews are the man behind the curtain controlling the levers of power. But in actuality, anti-Semitism functions as that curtain. It is that smoke screen that makes it difficult for us as communities to go and be able to vocalize and identify these larger interlocking oppressions. So why do we need to understand this now? Anti-Semitism works in relationship with racism and xenophobia to divert people away from the systems oppressing them. We can't change those systems if we buy into the diversion. And our movements need to learn about and be able to identify the underlying power structure to dismantle racialized capitalism and massive power inequality. And it's not ever gonna be by believing it's the Jews. And second, and this gets into our, 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 our final uh, portion of the, the presentation, this political moment is loaded with conspiracy theories. And a lot of them have their direct roots in anti-Semitism. It's so important to understand this in order to unpack and undermine them when we see and hear them. So white nationalism, we're just gonna go right into it because we got 30 minutes left. It's American as apple pie, and it's now a global export. So first things first, you probably hear these terms used all the time, um, and probably not with much clarity when you tune into any uh, uh, major news network or look in a lot of uh, major news outlets. Um, white supremacy and white nationalism, uh, if you remember um, uh, like geometry class, how there are squares and rhombuses, um, and all squares are rhombuses, but not all rhombuses are squares. All white nationalists are white supremacists. Not all white supremacists are white nationalists. So why is this important to know? Well, white supremacy describes, and this is really flattening it because it's an extraordinarily in-depth topic. Um, we're gonna just synthesize it down to the belief that white people are superior to other people. And white people has an asterisk next to it because you ask white supremacists and white nationalists who counts as white, they have a million different opinions. Um, but it also applies to systems. You can have white supremacist systems, systems that were founded by people who vocally held those beliefs, um, systems that have had longstanding laws written by people who had those beliefs. And they can still apply to systems that even though they might have gotten rid of the official words that are saying the racist things, still continue to enforce those artificial societal norms that were created by those white supremacist systems. That's why if you hear people say that the United States is still a white supremacist system and you might think, well, we have the civil rights movement. Well, the civil rights movement was not a magic edit undo button that made all of the bad things go away one day in 1965. It was the culmination of a century worth of organizing across black communities in the United States and abroad. And further, it didn't fix everything all at once. A law doesn't fix everything all at once. If a law fixed everything all at once, then we wouldn't have needed the civil, people would not have needed the civil rights movement because the 13th and 14th amendment would have resolved those problems a hundred years prior. Laws don't fix things. They don't always do it. You still need to have people make it happen. And when we say that a system is white supremacist, it, we mean that it is still enforcing these notions. It still is relying on logics that come from that very long history of colonialism, of imperialism, and of institutionalized oppression. That's what people mean by that, if you hear that. People say that. But white nationalism says, we like that so much that we want to make a nation state, like a country, specifically on those ideals, like exclusively for white people. So white nationalism is inherently a white supremacist ideology. This may be confusing, but you can have people of color, people who would fall outside of the definitions of who counts as white within society, be white supremacists. Absolutely. You can latch yourself to white supremacist notions, even if you aren't part of that in-group. Um, white nationalists, though, that is that in-group, and that is that group saying, we like this concept so much, we want to build a country around it. Examples of what a white nationalist society look like can include apartheid South Africa. It can include apartheid Rhodesia. Even though the Confederacy predates uh, modern white nationalism, the Confederate States of America is a perfect example of what a white nationalist ethnostate looks like. Um, it is the idea that white people are a unified ethnicity uh, that have a um, uh, inherent biological and cultural superiority to others, and therefore they need a country to unify and defend themselves with. That is what white nationalism is. And that's why it is white supremacist. 
So an extremely short history of white nationalism. So first things first, the lost cause. So Reconstruction, that period right after the Civil War, or as in my Texas uh, uh, history books, it was called radical Reconstruction, it was not really enforced, pretty much at all. Uh, even if you grew up in the South and your textbook said that it was over-enforced and that's why they had to do Jim Crow, that's made up. That's a lie. That's actually part of the, the Lost Cause mythology. Because the thing is that ex-Confederates, they weren't really punished at all. Um, they all, all they really had to do was put their hand on a Bible and say they wouldn't do it again. And then they got to go and become judges. They got to become sheriffs. They got to become senators, anything they wanted to be. Most of them never lost any of their... Uh, any of their property beyond the people that they viewed as property. Uh, they got to keep all of the physical plantations. They got to keep all of the land. They got to keep all of the manufacturing facilities. They just didn't get to keep human beings as property anymore. Um, and what ex-Confederates realized uh, after they waged a war of terror for about a decade in order to go and force the federal government to retreat and no longer enforce the uh, aspects of reconstruction that were barely enforced, um, ex-Confederates realize that history is written by those who hold the pen. It's not written by the victor. It's written by those who are writing it. And what they began to do was rewrite the history. It was no longer that the Confederacy seceded over slavery. That's a bad look. That's a, you don't want to be involved with that. No, no, no. They, they seceded for states' rights. States' rights to what? Don't ask. It doesn't matter. Um, and it's this building of this idea of the pre-Civil War uh, South as this uh, land of chivalry, almost a King Arthur vision of an America full of gentlemen and gentle ladies. Um, that gone with the wind type of uh, portrayal is exactly what the lost cause is about. It's about the idea of the South wasn't really that bad. Yeah, they were just behind the times and they liked enslaving people, but really they didn't know any better and they still were perfectly fine gentlemen. That is the lost cause mythos. And it became incredibly popular in the periods of the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. And it's stuck with us ever since. It's become, it's beginning to finally wane, um, but it became incredibly popular. And this period of time, when we think about it, people are now being able to, uh, they're able to go and buy like pulp fiction novels. Your people are moving on uh, trolley cars and trains to get to their workplaces in growing cities. And you're reading short books and novellas. And many of these books are tales about the wild west, or about this pre-war Confederacy. People are, in, are, are beginning to absorb this, this pop history, this false history, and believing this is what the South was like. And then comes Moving Images. The very first feature length film in film history was The Birth of a Nation, a Confederate lost cause fever dream that said the original Klan were the good guys. Um, President Woodrow Wilson loved it so much that he screened it at the White House. And while he was president, he also went and um, force fed um, suffragettes uh, that he threw into prison uh, who were on hunger strike. He also went and instituted the first uh, Red Scare. He also went and invaded Mexico and Haiti and a whole bunch of other things. We think of him as some progressive champion. He was not that great. He also resegregated the Postal Service, which was like nominally desegregated a few years ago. And he was like, I'm not going to have any of that because he was the only president we had who was born in the Confederacy. He was born in Confederate Georgia. Um, so the first Red Scare brought this up a few times. So what's the deal? Well, I mentioned that the Russian Revolution's happening and there's this anti-communist paranoia and the all across the nation, black and immigrant communities are being viewed as hotbeds of Bolshevism. And throughout this period, there are pogroms being enacted largely on black communities across the United States in places like Seattle, in places like East St. Louis. The Tulsa massacre of 1921 is at the tail end of the first Red Scare. Um, earlier this week was International Workers' Day, May Day, which is from uh, an American event, the um, Haymarket Affair in Chicago. Um, but during the first Red Scare, they created an alternative holiday called Loyalty Day, Loyalty to America Day, um, to go and cover up uh, International Workers Day. And that was part of that first Red Scare. And that was just a couple of weeks, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks prior to the pogrom that was enacted on the Black communities of um, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And those, what happened in Tulsa was not the only time that happened. That happened dozens upon dozens of times 
during those, uh, during those years and the years leading up to it. And in the Roaring Twenties, the clan has resurged with nearly 4 million card-carrying, dues-paying members. Keep in mind, again, they didn't have instant transfer banking things. These were people who said, I like the clan so much, I'm going to go and sign this membership card. I'm then going to go and put some loose change into an envelope, and then I'm going to mail it to wherever the clan headquarters is. That's how much these people liked it. And there were 4 million of them across the United States. Keep in mind, the United States population was half of what it was today. So I guess double that. That's like if there were 8 million clan members today. It resurged, and it wasn't in the South. It had people in the South. It was refounded in the South on Stone Mountain, Georgia, but its core membership was in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in Indiana, in Illinois, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, all of these places, in industrial places. And Henry Ford, at the same time, he's distributing his uh, newly translated copies of the International Jew, AKA the Elder Protocols of Zion. This is a huge period, immense growth of hate groups in the United States. And most of the United States, we think of it as the Roaring Twenties, but very similar to now, massive wealth gap. The incredibly wealthy are doing very well. Everyone else is not doing too well. And then the Great Depression makes everyone do way, way worse. Um, it is not a period of everyone's doing well. It's just the tippy top that is. So again, there is a tremendous amount of uh, that social malaise being agitated to pull people further into hate groups because people are already inculcated with an incredibly anti-Black and anti-Semitic uh, anti culture around them. And in the Great Depression, uh, we see several things happen. These fascist groups grow. Um, and there's this thing called the business plot, which attempted to th overthrow FDR as president. Uh, George W. Bush's grandfather, George Pres uh, Prescott Bush, was part of this business plot. Uh, it failed because uh, Whistle, uh, the guy who they tried recruiting, uh, uh, General Smedley Butler, who at the time was the most decorated soldier in U.S. history, blew the whistle on it, uh, took him to Congress. Congress held one hearing, and then they did nothing else. They were like, we can't have this on public record. Half of these people are our own people. And then they just kind of like tied it up and called it a day. Um, and while the people in the business plot were never punished, they had many, many groups that they were funding. Many of these groups across the United States existed, and they were funding them to go and terrorize people across the U.S. Groups like the Klan were being funded by wealthy people like Henry Ford. Henry Ford dabbled in a different group, but all of these groups were highly reliant on very wealthy people uh, uh, back, uh, backstopping their efforts. And it was mass popular front politics, a multiracial, multi-faith coalition of socialists, communists, sharecroppers, trade unionists, Democrats, Republicans, because the parties weren't that different back then. Uh, we, they weren't as polarized back then. People said, we're done with this. We don't want these people terrorizing our communities. And popular front politics is what pushed many of these groups back into the woodwork, uh, not a bunch of show trials. It wasn't trials that did it. It wasn't suing a Nazi that did it. It was going and having 4,000 people standing outside of a convention center, not letting the Nazi speaker walk in that did it. That's the type of stuff that scared a lot of these groups back into hiding. So who were these groups? Well, there are some of your prophets of deceit. That's the title of that book I mentioned earlier where we got social malaise from. This was the last high watermark of American fascism, which we're kind of approaching again today in terms of uh, mass movement involvement. Henry Ford, I've already mentioned, uh, he had his company town, like many uh, magnates of the time, uh, in Dearborn, Michigan. He owned the Dearborn Independent newspaper, um, and he printed the Elder Protocols of Zion in his newspaper, which was then distributed to all of the people who lived in the housing that he owned. Um, and they all worked in the factory that he owned. But he said, it's not me that's charging exorbitant rents. It's the Jews, even though he's the guy who owns everything in town. That's Henry Ford's whole game. And this gets the attention and adoration of Nazi Germany. German Americans, who are still quite connected back home, uh, who are getting involved with the Nazi party, see Henry Ford stuff and say, hey, you got to see this. It's like that scene in Back to the Future when um, uh, Chuck Berry's cousin calls him and says, Chuck, Chuck, you got to hear this. There's this amazing new sound. That is what these Nazis were doing with Henry Ford's stuff. They were calling back home to Germany and said, we've got some great stuff for you. Um, we had Father Coughlin. He was the first the shock jock radio host. We have a very long history of him here in this country. His show had millions of listeners. I think at one point 
his show had like 20 million listeners, which at that point in time is like a 10th of the U S population. Um, and he used his immense platform to spread conspiracies, much like the televangelists of the 1970s and the far right personalities of today. Uh, think Rush Limbaugh, Alex Jones, that's Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin really popularized the concept in the United States of Jews being simultaneously responsible for all of capitalism and all of communism, both at the same time. Doesn't make much sense, didn't really matter because people were scared, people were looking for something. And Father Coughlin made them feel heard. That is where these agitators found, uh, found their spotlight. Charles Lindbergh from Minnesotans, he's remembered quite fondly. He shouldn't be. We also shouldn't really just think of him as guy who had his baby stolen. Uh, he is also guy who bankrolled the Silver Legion. He is guy that got a lot of adoration again from the Nazi party, uh, from many of Europe's fascists. And he himself was uh, considering a run uh, as a America first, a fascist candidate in the 1930s. But who's the Silver Legion? Well, the thing is, is that fascists love their silly little outfits. You had the brown shirts, you had the black shirts, and you had the silver shirts. And today you have the Proud Boys with their silly little polo shirts. Fascists love their matching outfits. And the Silver Legion uh, were the largest fascist group in the United States in the 1930s, bigger than the German, uh, German American Bund, which was the big Nazi group that had uh, like a 40,000 person rally in Madison Square Garden back in the 30s. The Silver Legion actually had a higher membership. Um, and Minnesota played a central role in their organization. The silver shirts, uh, had allies in in government. They had allies in police departments. And um, the Silver Legion were the group that I was talking about a moment ago when 4,000 people stood between the convention center and the Silver Legion's leader and did not let him get into that convention center. But because the Silver Legion spent so much of their money on that convention center, they kind of bankrupted themselves. And that's how they ended up uh, beginning to atrophy as an organization within Minnesota. But it didn't just stop in the 30s. Uh, not surprisingly, it was uh, not particularly popular to be involved with Nazi movements in uh, the United States while we were at war with Nazi Germany. So many of these groups began to kind of just huddle underground, say, oh, we're, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, but just because they, uh, they changed, they didn't go away. And during the Second Red Scare, the, the period of the late 1940s and into the early 1950s, uh, again, we saw a continuation of this targeting of largely Black and Jewish uh, uh, individuals um, in the national stage. In uh, the Red Summer of 1919, it was, um, it was uh, everyday communities, it was uh, sharecroppers, it was factory workers being targeted. And in the um, uh, second Red Scare, it was uh, cultural uh, workers. It was people who were movie stars, movie writers. It wasn't just uh, you know, the Hollywood 12 who were largely Jewish movie writers, it was also a large number of uh, Black entertainers, um, actors, and um, singers who were being, uh, who were being uh, hunted down by the U.S. government and accused of uh, terroristic activities uh, to overthrow the government. And this, this played a massive role in the psyche of white America uh, in the civil rights movement, because you had that long history of racism, and you had this fresh feeling of, well, I mean, we can't do something about this. They're all communists. Uh, there are these fears. This anti-communism is tied into this anti-Semitism and this anti-Blackness and pulling away from the realization that segregation is wrong. Um, but eventually the civil rights movement begins to win. And you should really read up on the civil rights movement and watch and listen to as many things as you can about it. I can't describe uh, just how incredibly powerful that century worth of organizing was in this uh, remaining time we have together. But an important part for understanding where white nationalism continues to grow is that direct groups like the Klan eventually begin to be prosecuted under the 14th Amendment and Reconstruction era anti-Klan laws. It's piecemeal, um, but it's starting to happen. They're starting to lose their official power. The Klan goes from being able to march in open daylight to then having to terrorize people at night because more and more um, communities are arming themselves against the Klan. That's a big reason why they kind of start to retreat not just prosecution, but eventually the Klan starts to realize we've lost. We've lost the battle to retain segregation and they go back to regroup. And in the post-civil rights era, uh, especially the 70s onwards, white segregationists begin to realize that the tactic of mass resistance that worked so well 
for um, the civil rights movement, the mass resistance to segregation by going and sitting at uh, segregated counters, the mass resistance to segregation by not taking buses in an entire city for like three years. Um, mass resistance got the goods, direct action got the goods. It helped crumble segregation. And white Americans realized we can mass resist too. So they begin to do that to desegregation and they find new allies in new, new places. Um, white Americans begin to go and um, find new ways to go and resist civil rights era laws. So the Klan begins to realize Catholics who they absolutely hated, hey, maybe they're not too bad because some, uh, some congregations in the South that were Catholic in places like Louisiana were opening up new parochial schools to get around uh, desegregation laws. And the Klan was like, maybe these guys are all right. This is also when you start to go and see the integration of um, anti-abortion rhetoric into a lot of Protestant movements in the United States, because a lot of uh, white Protestants, especially out of Southern Baptist conventions, um, begin to go and cross-pollinate with more Catholics, um, talking to them, and start adopting something that was long viewed as a Catholic um, uh, uh, theological view of opposition to abortion, American Protestants begin to adopt it. There's a cross-pollination of these movements. And there's also professional coalitions of lawyers and businessmen investing in a long cultural and legal war to roll back civil rights of all sorts, from um, uh, gender equality, from uh, racial equality, to rolling back uh, housing equality, all of these things that we're starting to see this Supreme Court go and just gut, that, that Supreme Court is the coup de grace of these professional coalitions of lawyers and businessmen who invested 50 years ago into these infrastructures. And post 9-11, following the September 11th attacks, Islamophobia hits a fever pitch and a narrative of a clash of cultures or modern crusades becomes immensely popular in many US cultural spaces, which gets us to the Great Replacement. Once upon a time, the Great Replacement in its most modern version uh, was niche. It was coming from an 80s neo-Nazi phrase, the 14 words. It's a fantasy that a white identity is being erased through a great replacement of people from other backgrounds and cultures. But it didn't just start with 14 words, which is a bunch of garbledy gook about something, 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 we need our white babies or something. I'm not gonna repeat it because why do we need to repeat Nazi uh, ideology? The great replacement comes from a long standing paranoia among Europeans. Why is the great replacement uh, so powerful today? Well, it's a story that takes uh, the social malaise and redirects it with the extremely familiar catalog of racist ideas present in America and white European culture. And central to that fantasy is that Jews are orchestrating politics that will result in people, uh, in white people being outpopulated. The Great Replacement, we've seen earlier versions of it. This is why eugenics laws were so popular in the United States in the 1920s. It was the idea that black and brown people were going to outpopulate uh, white Americans. It was, th this is why uh, America passed hyper restrictive um, immigration laws during this time period as well. It was this eugenicist notion, um, but central to it, if you read writers like Fanon and others, because anybody who's experiencing the other end of white supremacy can tell you this has always been. This is why you don't need a degree to know this. You don't need to go and study uh, tons and tons of deep theory books. Public Enemy named it so well in 1990 with fear of a black planet. You don't need to go and read deep theory to realize that there is a paranoia among American and uh, Western European white cultures that all of these centuries of extraction and oppression, it's the rubber band pulling, and maybe one day it will snap back. Maybe one day the logic of that immense violence will be used against them. And that is that fear. That is, the, that, is that paranoia behind the Great Replacement. But the Great Replacement itself is that idea that white people are going to be outpopulated. So in these last few minutes, we're going to talk about radicalization today, because I can do it in five minutes. The thing that I want you to know about is the algorithm. The algorithm, it's just a broad term. Every social media and content service site is competing for our attention. We're both the product and the resource. Um, algorithms are meant to deliver content based off of interactions and views, right? It's just, it's just a tallying machine. It's seeing who likes what, how often they're liking it, seeing similarities and finding all of those things. It's just a big matching machine. But the algorithms are also built to send us content and they're built to be highly addictive 
to their delivery and users because we're the product and the resource. Advertising has always needed consumers to go and validate that it's actually worth something. But the difference between print, television, and radio advertising and algorithmically delivered advertising on app apps is that all of those uh, legacy versions of media, you didn't really know if your ad was effective unless somebody came to the store and say, hey, I saw the ad, I loved it. Or if they filled out the little uh, card and mailed it back to you for the rebate. Um, you didn't know if your stuff was effective. You had to do focus group testing. Now you don't need a focus group. You're getting live data constantly. And the entire point of selling ads and the entire value of ads is people looking at them. The more people who are looking at them, the longer they're looking at them, the more value it has. And that is why the algorithm's basic logics, why it needs us to stay on there as long as possible. Because that means more ads are sold. It's addictive, like a casino, where a casino doesn't have clocks on the wall, so you don't realize how long you've been there. An algorithm is going to continue spitting out content it thinks you like. But they're also easily gamed, because as we've sent things off to algorithms, it also means that people can easily go down um, holes of increasingly extreme content. Because if you like one thing or give it too much time and attention, the algorithm doesn't know if you're hate watching it. It just knows you're watching it. And it's going to keep sending you that. And simultaneously, moderation has been offset and given to algorithms as well, which means that users can gang up and go and mass report content from anti-racists and report it as racist. Because an algorithm can't tell the difference between you educating people about the, the horrors of ra racism and if you're actually saying you like racism. It can't tell the difference because it's a machine. It's a matching machine. It can't do these things. Artificial intelligence is artificial, but it's not intelligent. And lastly, this social media pipeline to violence is also happening from constant exposure. People are constantly exposed once they go down rabbit holes, but then they're also led to other websites, forums, et cetera, where they find community. They find that cure that they think they're finding to their social malaise. I am lonely, but I have found other people who think like me, who want to include me. And I think it's important to know about internet culture. I think the two biggest things that everybody should know about are Gamergate and incels. Gamergate is silly. I will send you an article afterwards, um, but it was a massive harassment campaign against anyone who was viewed as threatening uh, who counted as a gamer. This was in 2014. It read as young, white, male, loves violent video games. And the idea was women and minorities are ruining video games because now we're not just seeing muscly white guys with guns and skimpily dressed white ladies um, with very unrealistic body dimensions. Um, that is what the core of Gamergate was. It was a lot of young misogyny, but it was animated into a tremendous amount of violence. People were calling SWAT teams on their political opponents. They were calling SWAT teams on female journalists uh, saying that there was a hostage in their building. So because they know in America, death by cop is pretty likely. And if a, a bunch of cops knock down your door, there's a good chance that person dies. That is one of the effects of Gamergate. And the tactics of Gamergate continue to this day. Uh, those are still used by many, many groups, uh, far right groups to this day. And incels are an online community of men, and it's exclusively men, who feel they're deprived of sexual content. Uh, contact. And they believe they have a right to women's bodies. And when I say a right to women's bodies, it's in a very, very, uh, oh, shoot, handmaid's tale way. It's really gross and horrifying. But this, gr this grew also immensely in 2014. If you ask any young person in your life, anybody who's younger than me, I'm 31, um, 32 now. Um, anybody who's younger than 30, what an incel is, there's a good chance they know. Ask anyone younger than 24, they absolutely know what it is. That includes high schoolers. If you ask a high school in your high schooler in your life, do you know what an incel is? They will probably be able to tell you which kids in their school have incel vibes. They don't necessarily know the whole history of it, but this is still an ongoing um, kind of subculture across the internet. And I want us to close with everything is Gamergate. Gamergate was in many ways an inflection point for a social media age. It showed trolls they could use tactics old and new to abuse targets en masse to in the pursuit of reactionary anti-feminist politics. And a racist ideology became more mainstream in the era of Donald Trump, because this happened right before it. 
Many of the men who were involved in Gamergate became part of these campaigns that utilized the same tactics to push racism, anti-immigrant sentiment, and white nationalist rhetoric. This campaign began as a, reve as, a, as a perceived revenge against an allegedly cheating girlfriend, and it morphed into a retrograde wave that encompassed racial minorities, women, progressive ideology more generally. And the young men energized by these reactionary politics um, in these harassment campaigns created that network of online infrastructure for many of the hate movements we've seen explode in growth in the last few years. They became people who joined the meme uh, army of the Trump train or Brexit. They became the people who, who went and did a lot of the sharing uh, and networking for Charlottesville. They became the people who still go and sit on forums to this day going and sharing great replacement uh, mythology. So it's vital to know about Gamergate. And with that, um, that is the last of it. Um, I know we're just slightly over time. I always love to tell people to follow new social media accounts. Um, so here are some. Don't worry, though, you will be emailed a copy of this presentation. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions, um, comments, concerns. Oh, my gosh, it got so dark in my room. Sunset. I'm now kind of back in the basement vibe. But um, I know we're at time, but I'm happy to stay on and answer questions. I've, I've literally stayed on for hours after... Um, uh, after these just answering questions because it's fun for me.